So let me just check this here. All right. Adam Akiwa. Yo. I said that right. Yeah, you said it right. Excellent, it right. man. So for those of you that don't know, Adam is a... Are you brown or black now? You're, um, are you, are uh, you purple you black? belt still. Oh, you're still purple? <laughs> yeah. Get the heck out of here. Uh, bro. <laughs> it wow. Is it is. Wow. I mean, that makes me feel horrible. Because <laughs> I roll with you sometimes. I'm like, man, this guy. Because you've got me a few times with some hill hooks and stuff. Um, well... So I think there's like a there's like a hierarchy to the gym, and so I know that we're having promotions in June, and I think there's two people that are ahead of me that should be getting their belts probably to Brown, and then when we had our last promotions, Johnny told me probably a year, which would be this like end of this year. So you guys have promotions about once a year, or yeah. So and he does like striping promotions twice a year it's like at the midway point and then belts once a year i think that's very reasonable what was that my phone oh <laughs> no that's very reasonable because uh noah at our gym uh he has um promotions like once a year once every uh nine months or something like that yeah. it's just whenever he feels and I've never once thought, I've thought to myself plenty of times, like, man, that's a really good, that's a really good amount of time. You know, you don't need a promotion every, you know, twice a year or three times a year. So I think the only time you would use it is when you're, when you're, um, when, for the kids programs. Yeah. Okay. It helps the kids stay motivated. Sure. When they get to, that's why they got like white stripe, you know, they got the little stripe on the middle of their belt and it helps the parents see that their kids are progressing. Mm. But speaking of Tillis, um, yeah, my, I was at the open mat last night in my gym, and one of the guys is like, hey, I think I'm going to go to Tillis tomorrow morning. You want to go? Is that JC? No, no, oh. uh, Tristan. Oh, okay. And I was like, dude, I'm like beat up from open mats. I can't do two in a <laughs> row, like a night one and a day one, because right. they're young guys, you know? Right. So, yeah. That's what I did yesterday. Yeah. So I went to the morning class regular class and then i went to the night jujitsu mm -hmm. and a couple of guys were just gunning for me oh yeah and then i went this morning and uh last night was a little rough a couple of the guys were like uh talking some trash you know sure, sure. And i was just like hmm, i'm not used to that oh and yeah I, I was like hmm, that's kind of mean but whatever yeah i think uh you know everybody says that i'll leave your ego at the door and but People have people have ego for sure. Oh, there's, yeah. there's pride. There's ego. Like it's not a surprise to me. I'm expecting it. Um, there's sometimes when things are just, you know, I'm just not doing well. I'm not performing well. Like it's just training, right? But I feel like I'm not performing the way I should be. Maybe I had bad nutrition the day before or something, and uh, I'm like in the shower, you know, at home, like just water pouring on me. Like, dude, what happened today? You know, mm. like what what was why did this blue belt tap me out or something? You know, just stuff happens. But um, does that happen to you? Yeah, I feel like belt. it happens. Every it happens to everybody, dude. Yeah. We I, have this. We have this kid. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, we have this kid in our gym. He's he's technically a white belt, I guess, right? But he's like high level collegiate wrestler, mm. and so i'm like you know what he's been working hard to pass my guard i'll just let him pass my guard you know <laughs> and then he gets to my back and i'm like i can defend this and then i was like oh no i can't defend yeah, it yeah <laughs> and then i was like i have yeah. to tap yeah you put yourself in those situational where you let them get yeah. you in a tough spot that's happened to me too where i allow that to happen yeah. and then i got this white belt who should never ever tap me yeah and i can't get out <laughs> dude and they're gonna be talking about dude i tapped a brown belt right. you know? and you're like that's okay yeah, yeah. pride <laughs> So you know what I learned today also is that about you is you're also a pastor. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm an associate pastor at Calvary Chapel La Mirada. Okay. I think I've been six years. Six years there. Oh, wow. And you're also in a band? Well, I play in the worship team. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, what, what instrument? or what? Drums. Oh, yeah. sick. Yeah, so um, when I started playing... This is the crazy thing about church, right? There's so many people that have so much, like, skill, talent that you would never know, right? I was going to, I've been going to that church for, like, almost 18 years. Mm. 
And I, for the first nine years I was going there, I never touched an instrument or anything. Oh. I was just like a church person, you know. Yeah. And then um, all, our, our whole worship team went on a mission trip to Israel. And there had like another guy covering who was a friend of mine. And he's like, hey, didn't you say you used to play music before? Like, can you help and play the bass guitar? Because I used to be a session player. So I would get. I think you need to bring this just a little closer. Just a little. There you go. So I would um, basically bands would call me or say like, hey, we're going to record an album and we need um, like four tracks we're going to record. Or we're going to do a show and it's like a songwriter and she wants to hire musicians because she's going to play live. So I would do that type of work on the bass guitar. So um, I ended up um, playing with the worship team while the while the main worship team was gone. And then I started getting into the rotation because there's so many musicians. Sometimes they just try to rotate them, you know, okay. to give everybody a chance to serve. Yeah. Um, and then our drummer, he got um, called to lead worship as a, the main worship leader at another church, mm. like a church plant. And so our worship leader at, at Calvary La Mirada was like, yeah, he's a drummer. Like, we don't have any backup drummers. I don't know what's gonna, what we're going to do. And I was like, all right, well. Well, I've heard that, you know, because uh, I was in a small band uh, with my neighbor. Playing what? Uh, vocals. Oh, cool. And a little bit of guitar. Cool. And um, we had trouble finding a drummer. Yeah. And, and I remember him saying, oh, drive finding drummers, man. That's, uh, that's hard. Yeah, hard dude. Hard to find drummers. Yeah, it totally is, right? Um, so we had, um, he left and, and what well, we had like three months for him to leave. I think it was like three months. And I was like, let me see if I can like learn to play the drums. So, um, I would practice and like practice at home and then the whole band would do rehearsal and the drummer would get off after they were done. And then the band would run through a song with me. And we did that for like maybe three months and then uh, the worship pastor started putting me on. And that was like the most terrifying thing, dude. Like, I was so terrified. Why? I felt like it was Why? like, like a, a train about to derail. <laughs> every every time I was playing, I was like, dude, I, I barely made it through by the skin of my teeth. Right? You, you thought you were going to like uh, Just ruin hit the, the wrong. Yeah. Well, because if the, it, like, it's noticeable, right? It's super noticeable for the drums just like fall off. Right. So um, it's like the singer singing the wrong words or something you right, know? Right. super noticeable so right. i felt like i was barely making it through every single service but like kept playing and getting more comfortable on the drums and yeah, you and stuck with it stuck with it stuck with it yeah i think that's always so huge uh that sometimes we don't understand and i certainly didn't understand with a lot of things that i do it's like if you just stick it out when there's always going to be some trouble with something yeah. especially something like playing an instrument sure I, i've always wanted to play an instrument and I've gotten to the, I've gotten myself to points where you're right there, man. Like, mm. if you really just kept this going, the first roadblock, if you just get past that first roadblock, you could really be good. Yeah. So I think I was thinking about this recently because my son's like trying to learn the guitar, and he's nine. Oh. And um, I was thinking about how, like, my whole life, I would just do just enough to get like competent at something mm. and then it would get too hard and I would just quit it and move on and I think one of the things that helped me to get past that sort of mentality was jujitsu right getting into yeah. the science of it getting past the like I'm, a, I'm at a competent level and then becoming like an expert in the science of it so what's the connection you think so I think um forcing myself to grind past those hard parts you know, just grind past that instead of relying on just external motivation. I don't feel like playing or I don't feel like going to class or whatever, just developing. And this is kind of like transfers to all of life, right? I develop a routine to develop discipline. Okay. So like I literally do the same things every day. I eat the same foods every day. I do. I have routines for everything in my life so that. When I don't feel like doing something, it doesn't matter, right? My kids ask me, like, you must love exercising because you do it every day. I'm like, actually, I think I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. think I hate it, yeah. you know? That's how I feel about running. But I just do it. Right. You know, so. Yeah. Now, you, now, for people who don't know, you, you used to be a big guy, right? Yeah. You lost a lot of weight. Yeah. So. I, my heaviest weight, I was 300, well, that I know, I was 326 pounds. Get out of here. Yeah. 
That's the largest I've heard. Yeah. You're you're like my height or a little taller. You're about what? That's 5'11"? I was, I actually, interestingly, I lost height when I lost no. weight. Yeah. Wow. I think because my feet were fat and <laughs> <laughs> like my shoe size went down. Everything. Like, huh, I, yeah. I lost inches here, yeah. but yeah, yeah. <laughs> gained inches south, please. Dude, it was wild, right? Because like I used to wear like 11 and a half shoe and then now I wear a 10. You thought you had big feet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the lady be like, no, your foot's a 10. I'm like, no, trust me, it's not, right? I'm getting work boots or something, and then it just didn't feel comfortable, right? Yeah. But literally, I just, um, yeah, so I'm well, like. Well, what's your weight now? So I'm at 195 pounds now. Holy moly. So you yeah. lost like a whole person almost. Well, to the lightest I got, I was, it was, I went to down to 155. But I was trying to see at what weight i could compete at okay. and i didn't really feel comfortable at one in the 150s like it wasn't sustainable for me were you always a big kid or yes yeah so what, i was what, thinking what caused that because it gets so heavy i was thinking about that like when i was driving here i was like oh, you know trying to think about like why was i you know fat and the whole life big boy um i just had nobody ever taught me you know my parents were both overweight um my whole family, like aunts, uncles, everybody was overweight. I remember being like the fat kid. I was the fat kid. Like I would get embarrassed when my mom would come pick me up because she was overweight, you know, and the kids would tease me. Mm -hmm. um, and I was bigger than everyone else. I was like a baby Huey kid too. So imagine like this big overweight kid. I'm like a head and shoulders taller than everybody else. Um, it just, I was just teased. So I think just bad nutrition. Nobody ever taught me you, you can't eat whatever you want whenever you want. Yeah. So. Were you alone a lot as a kid? I had a brother. I had a brother. So we um, we were close in age too, like a year apart. But um, he he was like lean. He was lean. Like now he's not. But yeah. <laughs> but he was lean. He just had a better metabolism. You know, I don't know what it was because we literally had the same nutrition. Um. And I think, uh, yeah, my parents just didn't track, keep track of it, you know. I was a big kid, too. I, uh, I was telling a story on, when I was doing a podcast by myself. So I could tell the story because probably no one, no one probably heard it. But I would walk down to the market down the street. They used to have this market called Alpha Beta. Oh, yeah, Alpha Beta. You remember Alpha Beta? Sure. I would walk down there, grab a big bag of chips, mm. a a bean dip or a nacho cheese cheese dip uh -huh. and a two liter of soda Dang. every day during the every summertime day. and Dang. like summer after summer Dude. you know i would just walk down the street walk it all back up and then i'd be watching saved by the bell all day yeah. or something like that yeah and i would just i wasn't no 300 pounds but i was a big kid i've always had trouble with my weight mm. uh, it's always been an issue but yeah so i think that's one of the things that i think people um don't really aren't really taught, right? If you go to the doctor and you're hurt, they'll say, oh, you need, to, or you're, something's wrong with your body, they say, have this medicine, right? Right. They, they don't ever say, oh, what's your nutrition like? Never. You know, and your nutrition can fix a lot of stuff. I actually got a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis mm. that I was able to pretty much get rid of just with my nutrition. How old are you? I'm 40. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I'm 40. Yeah. So um, I'm not like a holistic medicine type of person at all. I'm just saying, like, nutrition is really, really important for health. I think that's key. Uh, they were talking about that. I was watching a, a clip from Bill Maher mm -hmm. yesterday. They were talking about how uh, people resort to medications to deal with certain issues, their you know, health issues. And their, his guest, I don't remember her name, uh, she was basically saying that nutrition and exercise is all you really need in order to cure a lot of our ailments. A lot of the problems that we're experiencing physical that physically that whatever we're experiencing disease and stuff simply com managing our diet and she basically said just eating less because yeah. in this country we eat so much i mean i i i eat a lot i'm Me an too. i'm an overeater I, I will admit that um i can literally it's weird man especially if i'm not doing well psychologically i'll have i'll have a lot of processed food like cookies i'll eat like six large i'll go to 7-eleven and buy me six large uh oatmeal raisin cookies mm. and then a, a muffin mm. 
And then I'll go have a, some slices of pizza. And that's when I really start to feel uh, not just physically sick, but up here, I mm. feel sick. And I just like, I start you know, developing things like depression or feeling like this depressive state. Yeah. Um, but I, I know enough to recognize, okay, you're feeling this way because you're, you're treating yourself badly. You're yeah. body physically, you're eating crap. But it's like this vicious cycle because I'm eating this crap because there's, I must be feeling some kind of way up here. Mm. And then I'm feeling, uh, you know, like in, in a cycle. Sure, sure, I'm eating, sure. I'm eating a lot because I feel a way up here. And then I feel a way up here because I'm eating a lot. Yeah. And uh, I, I, one of the things that I really want to, you know, do on this show is like, is there's people who are probably experiencing the same thing with overconsumption. Sure. I think it's interesting that the Bible talks about gluttony. Mm -hmm. And I think that it, it, God knows that there's certain things that, that make us sick and unhealthy spiritually mm -hmm. as well as physically. And he puts it in there to remind us, hey, you know, you need to watch your diet. Yeah. It, this is good information for 2,000 years ago, but it's even more uh, important or it's, it's prevalent now, especially with the type of foods that are out there. Yeah. It's hard to find food that is nutritious we're not taught to grow our own food in, in the outside in the in our backyards or anything like that. We're dependent on the supermarkets. Mm. I've gone to Ralph. Oh, I didn't want to say Ralph, <laughs> but I went, I've been to supermarkets where the uh, like the lemons, for example, uh -huh. where there's like no juice whatsoever. Oh yeah. And they, have you noticed that? I got to hunt for um, for the ones I'm like. Yes. I know how they look from the outside, but I'm like hunting, you know. Right. Yeah. Because most of them are they're not right. Something ain't not right about them. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, are, are we getting, it's almost like plastic fake food. And yeah. I'm just like, what is going on? And, you know, we're, we're obviously an overweight, we're overweight in this country. Yeah. But I don't think we would be overweight if there was good nutrition, if, if the food we we're eating had nutritional value, enough nutrition that we need for our bodies. Yeah. I think we're still hungry because we're not getting what we need. I think about that a lot too. Like. So I, one of the things that I tell myself is, like, I'll never let my kids go through what I went through. Self-inflicted as a kid, right? Just being overweight. And so I teach my kids. My, my kids eat the same food every day, too. You know, they have they have this the same food, right? What kind of food are you giving your kids? So in the mornings, they'll have watermelon for digestion with some Greek yogurt and some milk. Oh, okay. For lunch, they have 10 ounces of some kind of meat and you actually uh weigh it out for yep, them yeah really 10 ounces of some, some kind of meat usually like pork or maybe chicken and um some celery some peanut butter um hard-boiled egg a little bit of cheese and uh that's it yeah and then for dinner um it's usually like maybe some chicken legs and a little bit of vegetable a little bit of rice okay and it's, I mean, depending on the day of the week, it's, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, Tessa is really good about cooking. Um, Nutritiously. I mean, you know, she, she you know, she, <laughs> she cooks, or well, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Like, sure. you know, for breakfast, we're, we're not as good because we're rushing, mm. especially me. Mm -hmm. And I'll make pancakes, mm. sometimes pancakes with chocolate chips mm. and, and some strawberries. But those pancakes are obviously no good. I feel like they just sit in my stomach. Yeah, it's not good at all. But um, And then, you know, for dinner, she'll make, like, leg quarters and yeah. broccoli with some cheese or something like that. But you know what I notice is that our kids go to a lot of birthday parties and mm. they go to a lot of events. And then every single time, and I noticed this over a year ago, I was like, man, these kids are coming home with bags of candy, like, all, every weekend. <laughs> Big, large bags of candy. And it's, like, so embedded in our culture to uh, have, you know, you got Halloween. Not to mention just Halloween and stuff, mm -hmm. but birthday parties. Easter. We, Easter. Christmas. Yeah, everything. Christmas. It's in just everything. Candy. Yeah. Candy. I don't think we realize just how big of an industry the the sugar companies are. Like, they're they're in everything. And and sugar's not just in candy. It's in our catch-ups. It's yeah. in our in our you know, the products that everyday products that we use then that we consume every single day, our mayonnaise, our, you know, I went to, uh, this is going to be, this is going to trip you out, man. I, I can't prove this, but go down and try for yourself. Okay. I, I went to, uh, one of my favorite places, which is Wingstop. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, I always feel like I got to be perf- careful what I say about <laughs> companies. But anyway, sure. you get the French fries and it's drenched in sugar. Really? Sugar. I'm like, there's. It tastes sweet. I'm like, yeah, there's sugar on these French fries. Mm. They got salt and sugar on the French fries. And, you know, it's like the trifecta. It's like sugar, salt, and fat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They, they went, they got all three. Yeesh. I mean, because, you know, they're fried, so there's got to be some fat. And then um, mm. sugar and salt. Yeah. And they're so good. I love them. I dip yeah. them in the ranch. I, I mean, it's like a dirty little pleasure I have. But, sure. but obviously, that's extremely unhealthy. And they, the wings themselves have sugar on them. I could, t- I, really? could taste, I could taste it. I could taste it, man. So I was going to bring something you said earlier um, I wanted to comment on. So you were talking about how, like, you notice your nutrition it will affect you in your state of mind or it will affect your body, right? Mm. Now that I eat really restrictively, I notice, like, any sort of change in my nutrition, I'll, I'll notice how it affects me. So, for example... Mm-hmm. Right. I, I'm usually playing around with my diet, trying to find out how I can get the most protein with like the least amount of calories. Um, try to keep the fat a little bit low. And so I started eating um, the carton of egg whites. Right. Okay. So my wife, she'll she'll get a like a baking sheet and she'd pour the egg whites and put a little salt and pepper and then bake it in the oven and then like fold it up and put it in a meal prep thing. Right. And it's just very low calorie, very high protein. And I started noticing that the, for like the days I would, after I would eat those, my joints would be so sore, like really sore. And I wasn't putting two and two together. Like, why am I feeling so, so bad, sore in my joints, right? So I started looking at the label and there's like 5,000 milligrams of sodium mm. inside that carton. Plus, my wife was putting salt, and I couldn't taste the sodium. I but just it, but it's there. But it's in there. Wow. And so once I cut them out, joint pain went away. It's totally went away. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, so definitely what you're saying is true. Like, your nutrition can affect your your not your mind, your your body. Like you Yeah, start to feel- I, I never thought about, like, things like inflammation. Yeah. Like, my elbows right now are hurting. Well, I, I was at jujitsu too, Ugh. but 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 I also feel at night because sometimes I have to get up to. Use, I'm older, you know. I sometimes I get up at night and use the restroom and stuff. And depending on what I ate that day, it determines whether or not I'm waking up like like an 80 year old man, mm. or if I'm waking up like a a young healthy 45 year old. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, most of the time I'm eating like crap, so I feel it. And, you know, yeah. I mean, imagine, you know, someone breaks into your house at night. I'm going to be like, one second. Wait, wait, yes, one second, please, sir. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So I think um, I started uh, watching my diet. So let me tell you about how I ended up getting from being overweight to not, yes, not, please. To not being overweight. Right. So um, I used to ride motorcycles and. I was really overweight, um, and the only reason I knew I was the weight I was was because I was in the hospital, I, and the the bed the bed had a scale. So mm-hmm. my wife was like, "It says three hundred and twenty six pounds," and I was like, "Oh man!" But anyways, wow. so yeah. yeah, so um, I used to ride motorcycles, and I was riding in the winter, and I ended up getting stuck somewhere that I thought was gonna not take that long, and um, I ended up having to ride home at night, and it was just cold. And I got pneumonia. Mm. So when I got pneumonia, um, it didn't, uh, it, it didn't, because I was overweight, it was getting worse. It wasn't getting better. And then I got basically a really bad chest cavity infection and I couldn't breathe. And so because I couldn't breathe, my brain wasn't getting oxygen and I was like stumbling around. My wife had to take me to the emergency room and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. They, I mean, they, they couldn't figure out like what was causing the infection. How old are you at this time? I was, I think, probably 34, 33, 34. And, yeah, go ahead. So that's only six years ago. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I think I've been on the healthy train like seven, six, seven years maybe. So maybe like 33. Yeah. Like my daughter, she was. So because she's almost eight because I was in there for a while. So, um, 
Is I, this, so she couldn't recognize you because you lost you lost weight. I lost sixty pounds in the hospital just from being sick, though. Just from being sick okay. and being in there for a while, and I had actually gotten disuse muscular atrophy from being in the bed mm. and being so overweight. So yeah. I mean, it was really bad, dude. My wife had to like wipe my butt and like get me out of the chairs and help me sit up, and it was really bad. But anyways, so um, the, they they came in and told my wife like, "Hey, we can't. He's gonna die. He's gonna die." So. Like, make sure you guys have everything, like, in order. They sent the chaplain in to come pray for me. And there just happened to be a specialist in the hospital that day. And they were like, hey, go check on that patient, me. Mm -hmm. And he figured it out right away. Which was? That I had... Um, the pneumonia? That, that Yeah, well, they knew I had pneumonia, but that I had... Um, it was called... Um, I can't even remember. It was some kind of infection, right, that required us special surgery so um they took me in they said you have to have an emergency surgery right away right by this point i can be like shallow like Ooh, yeah. right because i couldn't take a breath because my chest was so full of fluid right so um they put me no food or water for 24 hours because i had to get ready for the surgery and then they took my blood for the day of the surgery and they were like oh you're septic so you need a blood transfusion Jeez. so i had to go another day and by then i was like dude i'm i feel like i was like delirious but i the, the thing i remember about that time was agony i was just in agony in my body were you going to church at this time yeah i was a christian you're a christian at this time yeah okay. yeah i was just in agony i mean so many people from the church came and visited me but like i didn't even know they had come right so I just remember it as a time of agony in my life, just being in, in pain, right? And then um, the next day went, I had blood transfusion. My blood was good. They did my surgery. And the la the first thing I remember, and this is like the only way I could describe it, right? When I came out of surgery, I felt like, like I was drinking a cold glass of water when I breathed. Like, uh, like it was quenching thirst. It felt so good to breathe. Um, and then, uh, you know, they had, they broke my ribs. They had to, had to break my ribs to get in and, and do the surgery. And then I had some gravity tubes in to get the last of the fluid out. But, um, it was a, a brutal time of my life. I wanted to get out of the hospital. I got out as soon as I could. And my wife had to take care of me for an, another while, but brutal. What were you thinking about as you're struggling to breathe? You're, you're. 300 pounds, you're sick, you're on the brink of death, possibly. So in, in, in those moments, like before the surgery and the like time I was in the hospital, I couldn't really think. My mind was literally just delirious. I, I was out, not in the right state of mind. But as after I got out of surgery and I started to get better and more coherent, I was like, I gotta, I feel like I'm in prison here. I got to get out of here, right? And the doctor would be like, well, you have to walk a little bit to be able to get out. And I was trying to make myself walk and I had to do physical therapy because I had been, you know, late. My legs weren't working. My arms weren't working. For how long were you? Uh, it wasn't even that there. long. It was like a few weeks. Like, I think it was like six weeks or something. But in that amount of time, just being sedentary. Yeah. You, you, be, you became, uh, they call it. Um, atrophied. Atrophied. Yeah. yeah my, my body was atrophied. So, um I ended up getting out, and my, my little girl, she was like, who are you, you know? So, um, yeah, when I got out, I was like 260 pounds. Okay. And it was because I was forced to just, like, I couldn't eat, but they would try to make me eat, and anything I did eat was hospital food and, like, restricted diet. You know, they put right. me on a restricted diet. So, um, But your I, body was just like, nah, I don't want to eat. I, I felt like I didn't want to eat. And at this point, I was really like, I hated food. I just hated, because I knew in my heart, like, that's what caused this. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't been so overweight and so unhealthy, I would have survived a motorcycle ride in the cold better. Yeah. You know, but I was such a, a unhealthy person. So. Was there a point where you had a discussion with yourself about, you know, maybe like there's, there's some changes that have to be made? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I was just like, t you know, I so right when I got out of the hospital, I was starting to get mad at God. I was starting to get mad at my situation because I literally, 
I have like scar tissue in my lungs now, so I couldn't really take deep breaths. I had a really like a really soft voice, like you know, I couldn't talk strong. Um, and my wife, she'd be like, maybe, maybe you might want to like try playing drums again. Like, no, I don't want to play drums anymore. You know, maybe you want to like ride the exercise bike. No, I don't want to. Ex- I was just like depressed, like miserable. You know, like I can't. I'm not the same person anymore, right? And I think that was like the point, right? God's like, yeah, I don't want you to be the same person anymore. Mm, yeah. You know? Um, but to my wife's credit, she was right. You know, I started getting on the exercise bike a little bit in the morning and it like fixed my 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 lung, my like passive soft voice, fixed it right away. Mm. You know, my body got stronger right away. And I was able to get up and walk around right away. Now, you were you doing jujitsu? Was had you even done jujitsu at this point yet? No, no. So when did you start getting? Well, first of all, did you? Would you? What was the first thing that you did to get yourself to? You know, to get yourself going in the direction of better health. Like, what? What? What, what did you do? What was the first thing you did? So I said, okay, my weight went down when I was in the hospital. I'm gonna mimic the food that I ate in the hospital. I'll just mimic it at home. So you figured out that hey, eating less is. Right. Causing me to lose weight. Right. Because okay. it, was, it wasn't, it was like, different food. It was just smaller quantities of food. Okay. Right. So I was like, let me copy what I was eating in the hospital while I'm at home because I know that's safe. Okay. Right. And then I would just ride the exercise bike a little bit in the morning because that was literally all I could do, just not being an athletic person. And, um, like, these little changes over time, over time, just made a difference. I didn't try to – I think that was, like – one of the things that kind of tripped me up in the past, right? Because I've been on so many diets. I was overweight my whole life, right? So I tried everything. And I would just get to the point where I was miserable with myself. And I'd say, that's it. I'm making a change. No more. And I would do a complete 180. And that would last for about two weeks or a week or whatever. And then I was right back where I was. Mm-hmm. It was just impossible to change everything about myself at once. Yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to that. You know, it, some, Sometimes uh, my wife would be like, you're just impulsive. You're trying to make all these changes at one time, and it's like you're just falling off. It's a short-lived. Uh, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to do. So um, over time, things have changed, like little by little, and just sort of refining my nutrition and adding more um, athletic activity, physical activity to my lifestyle. Um, and the reason I got into jujitsu was actually because my son, because my son was in jujitsu first. Really? Yeah. How that how that happened? So, uh, he was like this, like if you ever think of like a crazy little kid, he was a crazy little kid, like running around in circles, crazy, right? We didn't even have sugar. He was just running around crazy. And I was like, "Tell my wife, Diana, we got to do something. Like, we got to put him in something that's gonna calm him down because he's crazy." And she was like, "Well, what about gymnastics? Because he rolls around a lot." And I was like, "You know what? Uh, okay, try gymnastics." And so she took him, and it was all girls. And so I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not putting him with, with a bunch of girls, you know. It's, it's, he's, gonna, he's not going to fit in, right? And so she goes, hey, you know what? This guy I went to school with, he just opened a jiu-jitsu gym. Um, maybe he can go try that. And I was like, yeah, that, that sounds cool. Like, put him in, right? And so he started, because he was really little at this time. He was, like, almost three, and we would just pay for a private lesson, like a 30-minute private lesson. Where he, he started jiu-jitsu at three? Almost three. Almost three? Yeah, he was like two. Wow. Two, almost three. That's like unheard of. Yeah. And if he, you're lucky, you get him in at five. Yeah, he, so he <laughs> yeah. was almost three, and he would like, we, it was private lesson only, right? So we paid for like a 30-minute private lesson, and he would just learn to like shrimp and, and forward roll and like bridging and just kind of the functional movements. And then once he was able to like get through that, um, he joined the class and then he would do that part with the class. And then once the technique started, he would be done. He'd be done. He'd be done. Right. And uh, then he kind of got a, a little bit older and he was able to get through the techniques. And then he started going live and I could see how emotional and hard it was on him. And I was telling myself, I can't, I don't feel right about having him do that. And I don't know what he's going through. So let me try it and see that way I can relate to him. And that's why I started jujitsu because I could see him crying when he was going live, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so how many years ago was this that you started? 
So it was after I got out of the hospital, but I think it was like the same year I got out of the hospital. So you've been training for what, five years? No, it's, um, I think in September it'll be seven years. Yeah, all right. So yeah. by as long as me then. Yeah, I think September yeah. it'll be seven years. Wow. Okay. And then have you been competing or done anything? I compete uh, as much as I can. Oh, still? Yeah, I still compete, yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of, it's, it's, you get a lot of experiences, a lot of stories. I mean, I've competed against a UFC fighter twice. Who? Um, this guy, na- same guy, beat me two times. <laughs> uh, his name is, um, I can't remember. Okay. I can't remember. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> he competed at 155, but in jiu-jitsu he was at 170. And I was in the 170s at the time. Um, he beat me once. And I said, you know what? I can get him again. And he beat me again. He hooked two times. Both times. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah, he hooked, he hooked me twice. Do you train gi at all? Uh, I did once recently. So we have open mat, right? And one of the guys comes from a gi school. You're not supposed to come from that school, but he sneaks to our gym to do no gi. You know? Why? Why is that? They don't let him do open mats. Like, uh, I don't know. That their, their gym is weird. Huh. Right, they don't let them cross train at another other gyms. Interesting. Yeah, but so he came and he was like, "Hey, dude, like, I can bring some geese." Cause we, so we do this. Um, I try to do this thing every so often for the team where I go, "Hey, everybody, you guys, your gear that you don't wear, maybe your kids outgrew it or whatever, bring it. We'll do like a swap meet." Yeah. So everybody brings their af, af, between the kids class and the adults class, we just lay out all the gear and everybody can just get what they want, leave what they want for someone else. And he brought geese, and I was like, "Dude, let's put these geese on." Yeah. You know, so I was just put the gi on. Is it feels like you have a weapon when you're training. It's so fun, dude. Yeah, it does. It's like you, yeah. you're walking around with a rope. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> dude, I, I have another weapon to use. It right. was so fun, but I don't. I've never trained in the gi. You know, anyone that I've ever uh, trained with who started off doing no gi only, and then they they dabble in some no gi. I mean, some gi. They always end up converting. Yeah, it's fun, dude. It's, it's very so fun. fun. I love gi. Yeah. And I think it's silly when people say, oh, that's not practical. People don't walk around with kimonos on. And I'm like, really? You they sure wear, about that? They wear jackets. They wear they, jackets, yeah. sweaters. Mm-hmm. People wear jeans, Levi's. Yeah. That's a gi. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, even if you're just wearing a T-shirt, you know, there's plenty of chokes that, that you can do with just a T-shirt. Yeah, for sure. You know? And for it's sure. like, no. But, but I think both have their unique advantages i mean uh, the no gi stuff man you gotta that's you gotta move yeah you it's, it's, it's a lot of scramblier, it's lot of scramblier. Yeah, it's sure. there's not a you have to find different uh points in the body to grip or mm-hmm. you know, anchor yourself on yeah you know like when especially when someone's got like some definition in their thighs i'm like mm-hmm. yes <laughs> you're gonna hook onto that yeah little. i'm gonna hook onto that <laughs> nice quad you got right there that's buddy great. <laughs> you know that's great and uh and it, they definitely both are fun yeah they both sure. have their advantages, and uh, but yeah, this whole argument one way or another. It's I so think silly, right? It is because they're both they're both deadly, and they're both yeah. able to. They're both practical. In yeah, their own, in their own right, they're both practical, in my opinion. Yeah, I think um, it's. Uh, I mean, it's. it's Yeah, geese are expensive. Rash yeah. guards are expensive, dude. Well, that's why I don't compete as much as I would want to because every time I compete, it's like a, like I paid one hundred forty something dollars. I know, bro. And it's like for some, I, I see people doing it all the time. I'm like, man, you must have a great job because, or your kids don't eat much yeah. because you know one hundred forty something bucks. That that's food for the week, or yeah. you know for a few days really. Yeah, yeah. Had, like we have three kids that small ones still at home. I mean that hundred and fifty bucks is will get us will get us through like four days of for food, sure. you know, and it's like I just don't feel good about spending that kind of money. Well, I want to get my money's worth. Yeah. So I, I've noticed this as I've started getting into the higher levels of competition that some of these guys are so intent on winning that the level of jujitsu is actually a little bit a little bit lower. The mm. So, Interesting. Explain. Yeah. So I got into. Uh, I competed against a pro grappler. Um, he's a cop, and he uh, trains police officers how to control. Right. Yeah. That's his job. Um, but he was also competing, and we competed against each other. And he was so like wanting to win that he wouldn't engage me. Right. And so we ended up going. Zero zero, and the ref gives him an advantage win because I pulled guard. 
Really? Because I'm trying to get things going. Right. You know? Just and get to the ground then, guys. Yeah. Like you're just like, fine, we'll get to the it. ground. Yeah. He goes like, you know, let's go, guys. Like, Stalling, come on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, penalize you. So I, I, I pull guard, and then he gets an advantage when zero zero, right? Wow. So that's kind of messed up. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing more annoying than somebody who's playing it safe. Right. You know, we're here to combat. Let's do right. this. It's, the, I, it's the two dollar medal. That's what I'm saying. So this is what I this is why this is why I don't rip submissions because it's a two dollar medal. Mm -hmm. Like we got jobs to go to, we have lives to lead. But all, even in tournament, it's not that serious to me. But I also feel like, dude, I paid 140 bucks to do jujitsu. Right. So let me freaking do jujitsu, man. Like, come on, let's go. Like, if whatever, take a risk, have fun. Yeah. You know. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's not that serious. It's not that serious, dude. We're in the we're in the cafe gymatorium. <laughs> <laughs> it's not ADCC, bro. Even yeah. still, if it's ADCC, even if it you was, know, yeah. Like, so what? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I got I like I said, I compete so much. I want to show my teammates that even at an older age, you can still compete. So that's one of the main absolutely. reasons why I compete. Yeah, absolutely. And also because I just enjoy it, right? I enjoy testing myself. So um, at the at the two 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 tournaments ago. I was competing and I I hit an arm drag and the guy for some we're older right the guy's bicep tore what yeah he didn't say anything but his bicep tore wow and he we he messaged me on Instagram just from an arm drag yeah I that's don't know how you know you're getting old, <laughs> you're getting old bro <laughs> <laughs> he messaged me afterwards and he had like a a lump like oh the, the, wow yeah it was up like that that sucks yeah so um, I didn't know and so. Um, I uh, pulled guard again. Like, I pull guard sometimes, whatever, right? If I, I don't feel, see the problem with yeah, it. Yeah, I sometimes, I, I mean, sometimes I want to wrestle, but sometimes I don't, right? Yeah. Especially if, if you know, tactic, tactically, you waste a lot of energy at the stand-up. Yeah. And if there's nothing happening, I mean, I, I did a tournament before where we're standing up most of the time, but we just can't get each other down. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I wish someone would just, like, pull guard so we could just get get to it, you know? Yeah, so I can do my jiu-jitsu, right? So that was, that's my thinking all the time. My coach even tells me, he's like, hey, like, be more serious out there. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm trying to have fun, you know? Yeah. So, uh, anyways, uh, so I end up pulling guard, and then we go to guard, and he body locks me around my body, and he buries his head in my chest, tucks in his elbows, and I literally, I would, I, we were stuck, right? I couldn't get him. I was, like, framing on his face, trying to make space, and he was just hanging on for dear life. And the whole five-minute six minute round was just that right because i was and to his to i couldn't get out right yeah, yeah i couldn't get out but i mean it is what it is right i couldn't get out i was stuck but um he apologized afterwards he's like that's not i'm sorry like i i'm embarrassed he told his, his teammate was coaching him yeah and he's like don't do delete, delete that video don't show anybody it's embarrassing. He, he was embarrassed because he wasn't advancing or moving yeah, doing anything because he just laid on me but he was injured but he was injured, yeah. yeah. And I didn't know, right? Right, and he didn't say till afterwards. But he, he was injured, yeah. He was squeezing me so tight that I was work twisting so hard to get myself out, and I put my own hand between his body and mine mm -hmm. that my fist popped out my own rib. I hit, you know, how you have the little like. Pop rib. Yeah, yeah. I popped my own rib. Wow. So I was hurt too. You're just a couple old guys yeah, dude, <laughs> just breaking, beating ourselves up. <laughs> yeah. So I, I I've noticed like. We like if you have the ability and uh, the knowledge to do good jujitsu, why not use it? Why just have you know keep a top position and because it requires you to take a risk. Yes, you know, and, and a lot of practitioners are afraid to take risks yeah. because they put more more emphasis on winning than it's really necessary. Like you have an opportunity in that match to show to have a good match to like show off your skill yeah if you win or if you lose big deal like like uh i've seen people win matches where the whole time they just had an underhook and they were like trying to get a knee slice and then once they got it they just stayed heavy the whole time yeah. and they just waited to drain out the clock and it's like yeah you kept the guy from getting back up off his back but that was like three minutes of some boring jujitsu yeah. You know, and it doesn't have to be that way. It could be 
you guys are doing something really cool where people are like, oh, look at that. Oh, shoot, I almost got him right there. Oh, yeah, look at he lost it, you know, yeah. and that's that's more exciting. And if, and if you can show a better, more exciting match, even though you end up losing, it ends up not working out. Yeah. Great, man. You, you put on a good show. Or even when you're training, uh, people are the same way. And then I've probably been guilty of it too, you know, like, I'm tired. I just don't want to let this guy up because I just want this match to be over. Yeah. But think about how much more you can gain from just letting loose and trying new things. Yeah. Just try something new and, and don't worry so much about winning. So I run the open mats at our gym. Okay. Are you coaching? Is yeah. that what you're doing? Yeah, oh, yeah. great. Yeah. So I'm coaching um, Monday. I, I have privates that I teach and then I coach uh, the kids class. And Thursday, I coach another kids class and a, an adult fundamentals class. Oh, you're doing a lot. Yeah. And then Friday, I have a kids open mat and adult open mat. The kids have an open mat. Dude, the oh, kids open so mat cool. is huge, bro. Yeah? Yeah. I, I, sent, I put a picture on Instagram yesterday. It was like 35 kids. No way. Yeah. I must have missed it. Yeah, it's cool, dude. So, um, uh, I... You know, we, I warm the kids up. Everybody warms up together. And then usually we'll do like, oh, maybe do takedown for takedown to kind of get your body warmed yeah. up. And, and then we'll, we get water, we get mouthpieces in, and we go live. And before we go live, I always say the same thing. Like, hey, is this tournament right now? Yeah. No. Is this the world championships? Right. Are yeah. you guys enemies? No. Mm. Are you guys um, opponents? No. Right? Um, what's the point of our live time when we go, when we have open mat? To try our to try working the new stuff we've been learning, right. right? Absolutely, get that stuff sort of refined so that it's successful. So, what happens if you're trying your new stuff and it doesn't work, and you end up getting submitted? You tap and you reset, and you go. No big deal, right? Here's where it happens, and here's where it's okay to happen, so that when you do go to tournament, or if you're in in a situation where you have to, where somebody's being violent with you in the street, you don't have to worry about your stuff not working, mm -hmm. right? So. I go through my same little because we have visitors all the time, right? For the open mats, yeah. For the yeah. for the kids' open mat, so I I just kind of say my same thing generally to everybody, um, and then trying to trying to like build people up, right? Trying to build these kids into not just like good jujitsu people, but good humans, you know? Absolutely, one hundred percent. I think that we were talking earlier about how uh, jujitsu is a good tool when you're training people for life right how to overcome adversity and things like that one of the things that you know i really ponder on that idea because you hear it a lot from people about how jujitsu and life or they it's like yeah you want to get your black belt but you also want to be a black belt in life yeah you know? and so when i because i coach as you know and when i think about that i think about how when i teach the students i always try to tell them you know, talk to your partner and tell them, you know what, I'm going to be coaching myself through this technique. I'm going to go, I always tell them, go step by step. Don't skip steps. Yeah. You know, you when if you're doing a knee pass, well, don't just skip the knee shield. Sit in the knee shield for a bit. And then, you know, uh, you know, put your leg over or, you know, knee slide. Make sure you get the underhook, whatever, collect the head, whatever it is to get into side control, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's just like that in life. You know, if you have a goal, for example, and my goal is to be the best musician I can be, right? Sure. You're, if you understand because of your jujitsu that if I just follow the steps, a route, a way to get there, that's guaranteed will produce results. Cause no one's just going to wake up one day and, and get the guitar in their hand and be a, a professional guitarist. Right. But it, you, jujitsu can teach you that if I just follow certain, create steps, mm -hmm. like uh, if I practice every week on my scales mm -hmm. once a week, mm -hmm. and if I put 20 minutes in, mm -hmm. and if I learn how to, you know, move up and if I do, I'm going to do one technique of moving up and down, and I'm going to do, do, next day I'll do one technique of just staying in one bar mm -hmm. or whatever. I don't know. I'm just, I'm not a musician. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, yeah. But I really believe that, or even like in a business, Right. If I if I follow the steps to start a business, start with a fictitious name, you know, open a bank account, uh, start telling people about my business, 
show up every day. Yeah. Like with this podcast, show up every day, whether someone comes, whether I have a guest or not, just be here. Right. So, you know, the, those steps and you start to learn that, Hey man, I can achieve anything I want. Not because I'm this amazing person, but because I've learned a skill. Yeah. I learned the skill of following steps, following drilling. Yeah. Drilling. Drillers make killers. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's what I think is so cool about jujitsu because once people start to understand that there's a there's a method to the madness, mm -hmm. they their jujitsu level just go. Speaking of methods to the madness, right? I remember. So I try to take things like when I'm coaching, I try to take things that I knew were pro struggle for me, and so for example, right. I would be learning, okay, do this move and you move your body this way. But it wasn't sticking because I didn't know why I was doing it. Mm. So, for example, we'll be doing like, I have brand new, like the fundamentals class is for people that are brand, brand new, right? So right. we got like some brand, brand new guys. They don't, they don't know anything, right? Brand new. And I'm going over like bridging, right? This is so, they're, and they're like, okay, like, so let me explain to you. It's, why we're doing this movement okay put me on side control right mm -hmm. look here's a bridge I'm getting my knee in i'm back to guard it's a functional movement everything right. that you guys do in here it has a purpose right? absolutely yeah. so um I, you know I, I was gonna say something earlier uh when i'm talking to those kids right and you know some people might agree some people might disagree right but sometimes i'll tell them like try to control your emotions Right. Mm. Try to control your emotions because if you start losing control of your emotions, you're not going to be thinking as well. Man, that's so. Yeah, that's absolutely. That's so profound because a lot of times we, we want to panic. Yeah. And uh, Jiu Jitsu will certainly teaches you that you're you gain nothing by freaking out. Right. That's the second part. Right. So I'll say, you know, that being said, it's OK to cry, mm. but crying's not going to get you out of side control. No. You need to figure it out you need to do your techniques right so it just it just is what it is you know and some people say oh you can't you know that's too harsh to say crying's not going to get you out of side control but i mean <laughs> it, it is what it is dude we, and it is what it is and we need to raise stronger kids yeah i mean i i i believe that 100 percent that you know i didn't know not to get too far off topic but i didn't realize just how we're screwing kids up these days, you know, when it comes to public schools and all this stuff. You know, when I first met my wife, she would tell me things like, oh, man, uh, they're, they're making, we're producing weak kids, weak men, this and that. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> it wasn't until I started to, she opened my eyes to a lot of stuff and I started to notice and like, I started noticing certain things. Yeah. And I was like, oh, oh, man, I don't like to say this too often, but about my wife, but she was right. Yeah, <laughs> to her credit to her credit she was right she was right and i don't like saying that but she was and it's part of what, what what made me want to start talking to people is because you know i found i found jesus also again through my wife through my wife awesome you know and uh one thing i i noticed that i was stronger stronger than i was even when in jujitsu i didn't realize how weak i was as a human being mm. not having jesus in my life sure and uh, so it just made me think, man, I want to, I want to be, uh, you, know, how, you know, build people up. Yeah. How are we going to build stronger society? What can I do to give back? You know, I felt like the Holy Spirit was convicting me for. Sure. Like, hey, you had 20 years of being a waster, a drunk, 25 years of being a waster and a drunk, you know, and now it's time to put this to some kind of a use, right? Yeah. And uh, I think that things like, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that I found jujitsu Definitely. And, and Jesus, because now I, f I feel so much stronger. Sure. And I, and, and I, I want to tell other people because I know that there's other dudes like me. Yeah. That, especially like at my age, at 45, I never would have thought that I could reinvent myself. Sure. Like be something different. Yeah. Like, uh, man, the confidence level, especially as soon as I sobered up, it's so hard for, the, for God to work in you when you're not here, mm. when you're not present. My wife used to always tell me, you're not here, you're not present. Mm. And I, I always mm. like telling this story, but I'm like, man, I, I know everything you said last night. Mm. And, you know, and I don't understand what you mean. Mm. And it wasn't until I sobered up and uh, I realized, oh, man, I wasn't present for a lot of stuff. Mm. You know? So um, 
you remind me of something, right? I was having this conversation because, you know, I'm, I'm a, a father to a, a son. I'm a father to a boy and I'm a father to a girl, mm-hmm. right? And so my son, he says, life is hard for a man. It is right. Hard for Life a man. is hard for a man. One hundred percent. And so this is what I tell him, right? I'm like, listen, I don't want you to have a hard life, but I don't want you to have an easy life. So in a controlled way, I micro dose misery into your life, mm-hmm. so that you grow up with character. Absolutely. And so I'll put him with the kid that I know is going to smash him in live day, you know, or I'll. Um, you know, I, I just make things a little bit harder for him. You know, I make it a little bit harder. I make him, you know what, you got to do, your your report didn't come out right. You're writing sloppy. Write it again. Right? Yeah, it needs yeah. to look clean. And I just make it hard on him just a little bit to build his character. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's tough too, you know, as a parent, you always want to protect your kids. You feel bad for them, especially when like any, any little sign of suffering, you're like, oh, I just want to make it better. Sure. But it's to their disadvantage. Definitely. You know, you're, you're, that's, that's kind of, you know, not to um, talk down on my, about my parents. I had good, good loving parents. Sure. But they were so willing to make things easy on me hmm. and all of us. And uh, it, it turned out to be the worst thing that they could have ever done because um, it meant that we didn't know how to deal with struggle and strife and yeah. how to overcome obstacles when they got in our way instead. I, I was a quitter in, a, in, in many areas of my life. And it wasn't until I started certain people that I saw online, certain men talking about men's stuff, mm-hmm. whether it be like an Andrew Tate or, a, or Dr. Jordan Peterson or Joe Rogan or who are, you know, these people on sure, the sure. internet. Pretty sure it was other people, but you start to realize, holy moly, I'm not, I'm not living the, like a manly, I'm like kind of a weak man. I'm not living to my full potential here. Mm. And um, thankfully, I started to see that and really started to think about that. And it's part of the reason why I wanted to go to jiu-jitsu. I was in a real bad place uh, when I first started jiu-jitsu. And I remember I was reaching out to dudes that I knew who did jiu-jitsu. And, hey, man, maybe we could train at your house. Because I just couldn't afford jiu-jitsu yeah it's expensive dude. it really was but i knew there were a couple of guys who trained at their houses and and then i realized you know what man it's not their job to save me right you're gonna have to figure it out it's 150 bucks man get get it together yeah i mean when i was really when i when i first heard about jiu-jitsu they didn't have that i was aware of any gyms in whittier mm. they were like uh these gyms out you know especially like when hoist gracie oh yeah beat dan severn you know and that's when jiu-jitsu started getting popular and I took notice of that, but the closest gyms were far. Yeah. And, I, and at that age, I just didn't have the money. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, long story short, but just things like jujitsu, Jesus, all that kind of stuff, it's going to make you stronger. It's going to make you yeah. realize, like, I'm in a position now where I've, I have this attitude, like, man, I could, I could overcome anything. And a lot of that happened from jujitsu. Yeah, definitely. Being in the mix. Of, in the, I in think... For sure, sorry. No, um, no. I think, because um, I'm always trying to, like, recruit, right? I'm always trying to recruit people. Hey, you know what? Come to church, man. I'm, I'm either come to, it's either come to, I'm telling people come to church, or I'm telling people come to jiu-jitsu, right? And when I'm recruiting for jiu-jitsu, I'm like, yeah, you know, it, it teaches you how to deal with losing, how to deal, overcoming adversity, right? Control your emotions, you know, um, be um, in control of your body physically, you know, learn how to can make your body do what you want it to do. I mean, we had a kid yesterday at this, at the open mat, he was back flipping little 12 year old kid, just flipping around. Like, dude, sweet. This kid's crazy. dude. <laughs> yeah. This kid, he comes to our, that. dude, yeah. he comes to our open mats and he puts it on everybody. Is that right? Yeah. He just, he smashes through everybody. He's not that big, but so if I put him with the bigger kids, they can maybe kind of control him, but the jujitsu level is lower. Yeah. The only kid that he, it can that's about his size that he can be somewhat competitive with is like my son, but he's still just like 
he just mops through everybody, bro. And I and I feel bad because he comes. I want to give him some competitive roles, right? Yeah. So I'm like, uh, coach, you go with <laughs> put try to give him some some good roles. But the kids, kids, amazing. just too good. He's amazing. Uh, so he's like in a league of his own. Definitely, wow. definitely wow. gold medalist at ADCC. Oh, is that right? Wow, yeah, he's a tough kid. Do you guys have a uh, sports ministry at your church? We don't have a sports ministry. Um, I was doing jujitsu classes for families um for a while but then people weren't really being respectful of my time mm. and so that's too bad yeah i was like i'm not gonna do it anymore. i've been talking to multiple churches uh even my church uh we have a sports ministry but it's just basketball and soccer mm -hmm. and uh i've you know i've spoken to the um, sports pastor there there's a sports pastor yeah that's pretty cool we have our, <laughs> of a sports pastor and uh um shout out to pastor ray that's cool. And he, uh, but I mean, you know, he, the sports that he knows is basketball, soccer. Sure. Um, that just makes sense because he's not a practitioner of jujitsu. Right. And he likes the idea. I, th I think he likes it and I think he sees value there. Mm -hmm. I've spoken to other pastors that I know, friends of mine. Uh, my friend Luke, Edward, you know, other guys from other churches. There's a Calvary, I think it's in Mill Rock or Downey, I forget. But I'll talk to these guys about starting a sports ministry. Mm -hmm. And that it should be jujitsu. I, I think, so I, I had to tell the story of how Jacob was wrestling with God mm -hmm. in the last chapter of Genesis, I believe it is, where if you read the story, you're a pastor, so you tell me, but some people say it's an angel, mm -hmm. and some people, you know, it's debatable whether it's an angel of God, or, or whether it's God or an angel, but, mm -hmm. but he's, I, I imagine it's like, because he's telling you, let go of my leg, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, oh man, it's like, it's like Jacob has God in a leg lock. And because we wrestle, sure, like as spiritually we wrestle yeah. with God, you know, on a regular basis, every single day, I'm like wrestling with sin or whatever it is, you know, like I know what I'm supposed to do here, yeah. and I'm wrestling about what with doing what's right and what's and not right. Yeah. What does God want me to do in these situations? And I think it's just so fitting and so amazing how God puts this story in there about how he rests, he's wrestling with Jacob because that's exactly what we do. We, yeah. God's a wrestler. Yeah. And I'm trying to convince people of that. Yeah. Like these churches, I'm trying to convince them like God is a wrestler. And I see what goes on at these gyms. I visit gyms. I see the community. Yeah. I see the families together training and doing stuff together. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, I remember before I, right around the time I started going to church, I was like, man, don't, this is exactly what it is. It's just missing one thing. Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is the thing that's missing here. And I can't just start preaching Jesus at these, you know, secular institutions. Especially if you're working. Like right. At yeah. UFC. Like at UFC, I can't just, yeah. I do get lucky. A lot of my students are, are Christian, so yeah. I could talk about it. But if they weren't, I can't just be busting out with some Jesus stuff, you know? Sure. And, uh, but I'm like, the church needs people to be there people need church but they don't just need it on sunday for that one hour mm -hmm. and and my church does a great job of having you know programs you know like for aa mm -hmm. for divorce counseling they have all kind all kinds of programs but people need a, a healthy not just because they're broken in one area but jujitsu can fix people yeah like sure. they they first of all it's great exercise it builds confidence, motivation. I mean, it just does it all. And it brings people together. Because what, what do we need as Christians? We need fellowship. Yeah, We need to be together, build each other up, be there for one another. A lot of men that I know, I noticed a lot of men, and I've, I was one of those men, where I didn't have any men in my life to, to talk to about things and Build myself up. I've heard that so many times. Have you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've, I spent New Year's is by, by, my, by myself. Like, I realized, man, I, I suck as a person. I don't have anybody. Dude, I, I was talking, in my role in the church, I talk to a lot of people, right? I do a lot of counselings. And I was talking to, a, I was counseling a couple. And um, the wife was like the believer. And the husband was like, okay, I'm trying to get online, right? I'm I'm trying to make this work, but she had been a, a believer for a, lo a lot longer. And um, 
he told me, you know, I don't know how to do how to be a man, like a godly man. I nobody ever taught me. I don't know. I didn't have a dad when I grew up. I grew up like in, kind of in the streets. I don't I don't know what to do, right? Yeah. And for me, like I wish I could mentor everybody or be everybody's closest friend, but it's just not possible, right? So I, I try to get people connected in the church. Like, hey, you know what? C- come meet guys, you know? There's going to be people here that are your people. Yeah. Connect with them. Well, that's the thing. Uh, we have to build leaders. Sure. When, when Jesus Jesus changed the whole world, but he, he did it with 12 men. Yeah. You know, Jesus obviously wasn't going to go out and change everybody or help everybody all at once. But he chose these 12 men, as you know. I mean, you know better than me, brother. I'm just talking here. But but I he had these 12 dudes, and he realized, man, I could compound. I got I got 12 devoted dudes, or, you know, most of them were devoted, I'm sure, like Thomas and Paul. Well, Paul wasn't even the, one of the 12. But he had these men that went out there and preached the gospel yeah. and fellowshiped and taught others how to fellowship. And I, I truly believe that by building strong leaders strong men make it cool like jesus is cool yeah but people don't know it like jesus is a dope he's dope yeah i love the guy i mean the guy is amazing and he and and if we could build strong leaders those leaders can change someone like a paul you know like g like a a guy like paul man like Mm -hmm. who's gonna go out there and like be about it Mm -hmm. i think that's what we need we need guys like that 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 like people respect, and usually you find those guys. A lot of those guys are like, I think to myself, man, a lot of these guys own their own jujitsu gyms. Mm. These guys are like, they have successful gyms because they're they're influential. They're they they're able. These people look up to them, see them as leaders. Yeah. And like I, there's something about jujitsu and people who are practitioners that they just walk different. It, it, that's what it makes you into. Right. So to your point, right. Why do guys that run, run their own gyms and jujitsu typically are seen as leaders? There's something different about them. Right. They've just been beaten down and refined and refined and refined through the process of becoming a black belt or whatever. And and their character has been refined. They've been humbled and humiliated so much yeah. that that's just like out of them now. Right. Yeah. And that makes so much yeah. sense why a guy like, say, Noah. Uh, my coach Noah Tillis, oh. he's like a decade younger than me. He's so cool, but his demeanor and personality is that of someone my age. You know, yeah, like he's chill. Like where I look up to this guy who's like half half a, a decade younger than me. Yeah, he's so chill, dude. Yeah, he's super he's super. Yeah, cool. absolutely. And you know, you don't get to where you are at that level uh, by accident, right? You don't build what he's built by accident. It's not a it's not a mistake. Like it's. Years of like what you were saying, years of character building, refining, sharpening. Um, that's how you get to that level. Yeah. And so if we can build leaders like that, people that learn, wrestle, that actually engage in that wrestling with God and refine them, they can go out and make other leaders. It takes a leader, I think, to make another leader. Yeah. Um, there are men who, who get there on their own. But, yeah. but the, it's so much harder. Yeah. You know, I've, I've gone to where I am in life, all what feels like virtually by myself, but I'm 45. Mm-hmm. Think about where I could have got if I had mentorship. At if 16. Had, yeah. Yeah. You know, I was left, you know, like, a, my, I'm not to talk bad about my father, because um, he, he was a good provider, but he just wasn't a, a, a man who instilled any values in me. He was just always working. It was more important. I provide. Mm. I don't got to do anything else. Sure. You know, we live in an era now where like fathers are expected to also um, nurture their children and, you know, like spend time with them, taking the soccer games. That wasn't a thing when I was a kid. Um, But those that that mentorship, you know, being a father is like critical. Mentorship is critical. Definitely. And that's why we need elders. That's why. God made elders. Right. It's, it's to build people up. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, the learning curve is just, it's far. It's, it's, it's difficult. So that's why um, I'll share this story, right? When I first started, um, like, 
if you don't know, right, and you're just from the outside looking in, you're like, oh, these guys, why, why, why can they never miss a class of jujitsu? Like, what's the big deal, right? And they don't realize the the value that we have in it, right? It's like if you were going to school, like, oh, can't you just skip a day of class? You know, it's 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 that's it, you don't. It's not a thing we do, right? right? And I was first training, and then I started coaching and helping out with the kids' class, and um, uh. My senior pastor was like, hey, dude, you're too busy right now. You need to you need to cut some things out of your schedule. And I knew he was talking about my time in jiu-jitsu, right? Wow. And so I said, oh, you know what, let me, I'm listening to you. Let me, let me pray and try to figure some things out, right? So we used to have our staff meetings Monday afternoons, and they switched to Monday evenings, and I'm coaching Monday evenings, right? So that's where the conflict of schedule was. And he's like, dude, you got to free up your schedule. And so I was like, kind of like in turmoil, like, man, I got to be, I want to be faithful, but it feels like this isn't an accident. What's happening with, it's not something that's completely just out of my own desire. Right. Mm. So I start to pray about it and just kind of seek God's will for what's happening in in the situation. And uh, I come back and talk to him. I say, look, like, I listen to you. I I receive what you're telling me, but I feel very clearly from God that this is um, ministry for me, right? This is something that I'm meant to be doing. And so even though I want to be there at those meetings and I feel left out sometimes because I just kind of hear the, the play-by-play afterwards, um, this is where I'm supposed to be for this season at least. Yeah. And he's like, because he knows, right, the same Holy Spirit that ministers to him, he ministers to me. He says, okay, all right, it's fine. And I've just seen the fruit of, like the proof that that's what, that I'm I'm where I'm supposed to be is all the fruit that's come out of that, right? People from church are at jujitsu. People from jujitsu are at church. I mean, I've even had like, uh, they just, they don't even, because I'm always inviting, right? They just show up and I'm like, hey, you're here. I love that. You're at church, man. That's so great to see you. I know this guy, right? And so it's proof that not only is like, there's that cross point, but even like when you were talking about how you can't just go preach Jesus at, at work, right? I'm still able to instill those like biblical principles. I sneak it in, man. Yeah, the, the principles are the same, right? Yeah. And the morality yeah. is there mm-hmm. and the counsel is there, right? And so even without saying Jesus' name, I'm able to minister to these kids and build them up mm-hmm. and the adults yeah. as well. I mean, one of the- people notice. They notice. Like, what's different about you, right? Mm-hmm. I'm counseling. Uh, I'm doing premarital counseling for one of my buddies from jujitsu. They're getting oh. they're getting married, right? Okay. And he told me when he first started training jujitsu, like he had been training for a little bit. He goes, "You know what?" And this is like one of the best compliments I ever got. He said, "If I if you weren't there, I probably would have quit jujitsu." Wow. Because you were friend to me. You were nice. You know. Yeah. Encouraging. So, I was like, man, thank you. That's thank you for telling me that. What it's like, what I'm doing is is working. You know? It is. Yeah. And you know what I like to do is I'll sneak it in. Yeah. So when I tell people about jujitsu, I always say this line, and it's it's so I can sneak Jesus in. Oh, oh you'll love jujitsu. Oh man, I preach it like I preach Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like nice. just to throw it in there. Yeah, yeah. And then a, a couple, a few. There has been times where that started off a conversation. Oh, where do you go to church? Oh, I go to whack. Yeah. Or, you know, the, I, or, yeah, I visit other churches. I like to go with my friends to their churches. I don't, I don't have this thing where, oh, I'm faithful to WEC. I only go to WEC. Mm-hmm. I'm a member there. That's sure. my church. But I, I love visiting other churches. But I'll sneak it in. And that's how I found out my students are Christians. That's cool. Because I'll say, I'll, like, I'll make a joke sneaking the Jesus in there. And then people, they get it. They'll ask you. Oh, if, if they're about it, they'll, they'll notice. Oh, he said Jesus. There's something there. I'm going to ask them. Well, okay. So, like, like you said, like, people notice. this. Th- it goes both ways, right? Yeah. You, you're, at, you're at class and you're like, man, there's something about this guy, right? This student in the class, right? I, hey, are you a believer? Mm. I am. Oh, man, me too, dude. <laughs> That's so cool. I could tell, man, you know? Yeah. Um, and, I mean, look, probably the worst thing that can happen is somebody says, like, you're a Christian? I couldn't tell. <laughs> you know, like oh man, <laughs> that'd be horrible. Yeah, it, that's happened. it's happened. <laughs> Has it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
back in the days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's you know, funny. it's like, oh, I never want that to happen again. No. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I think about that sometimes. I'm like, I don't have any, like, I do have haters, sure. but, I don't, but I don't think it's because of Jesus. Um, but sometimes I'll, I'll talk to myself and I'm like, why am I, why am I not being persecuted mm. doing something wrong? I'm mm. playing it too safe. Mm. I'm not, maybe I should be, uh, more bold, more bold, more zealous. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I should be pissing some people off or something. But uh, I, I really love talking about God, sure, Jesus. You know, sure. I, I just think that uh, I think that every 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 man, just man and as in mankind, every man will bow one way or the other, sure, or bend the knee. Definitely, you know? it doesn't matter if it's in this lifetime or when you go before him, you will bow. Yeah, I mean, bend the knee. You know, and. Um, it might as well just be now. You might as well. My my life has gone. It's not that. It's not that problems go away. It's not that your life just all of a sudden is amazing. Oh my God! I believe in Jesus, and now I have no problems. And it's probably the opposite. It's the opposite. Yeah. yeah. Now, especially like when I got sober, when he sobered me up, man. Yeah. It's like good. It's for great. 20, 20, 25 years, I was trying to do it, trying to get sober. Mm. I just couldn't. And then I started. I started going to church with my wife, but I would. I would uh, be hungover. I would smoke weed. I had to smoke weed before I went to church. Mm -hmm. I liked going, sure. but I just, I was going to go high. Sure. I take my little vape and I'm, and I'm a full blown practitioner. You yeah. know, I'm, a, I'm already a, a purple belt at the time and I'm taking my vape pen and I, I just couldn't wait. So I would pretend I was going to go to the bathroom and vape in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. But, but I would just pray and be like, Hey man, if you want to change me, God change me That's crazy. within 11 months. Uh, just a week after Easter. So I just had my one year clean. Oh, that's awesome. And, and just, it's gone. It's crazy. Yeah. It's radical. Just, it's radical, man. It's like, wow, Jesus, like Jesus did that. He did that so, for me. The same thing like you're describing is the same way I felt when it came to, like, I believe I was food addicted. Oh, absolutely. hundred percent food. Yeah, addicted, right? addicted, yeah. And I, you're, what you're saying is like resonating with me because I remember just trying to, not be addicted to food, trying to not overeat my whole life. And, you know, the hard part with food is like, you can't not eat. Right. 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 Like I, if I could go cold Turkey from food, I would, <laughs> Yeah, but you can't, right. You, you got to eat. It's another level. It's so hard. Yeah. It's so and it's, hard. and it is an addiction. Uh, definitely. Which definitely. I suffer from too. So, so um, I think as the time has gone, I've been able to, and the more physical that I've gotten, I've been able to relax my nutrition or like not relax, but like add more things in. So it wasn't so strict and I have a little bit more freedom. And now I know how to like, oh, I'm going to this party where there's food that I can't control. Or I'm going on men's retreat where they're going to have food that I can't control. I know how to like eat when I'm, when I don't have control over the food, you know? Maybe I'm going to go to a party and I know there's going to be extra calories I'm going to have to eat, so I'll fast a little bit before. Oh, yeah. so you take protect uh, preventative measures yeah. to. You're paying. You're 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 being paying attention to what's going on. You have to. Have That's to. That's interesting. Yeah. So you have to. Uh, I guess like anything, you would you 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 have to know where where the devil is, what he's yeah. doing, and take measures to prevent. Because because I because I've had moments where I was as thin as you, and. Because of those parties or those events, mm. I end up overeating, and then I lose all motivation to, mm. you know, and then yeah. I, I I shoot right back up twenty pounds. Yeah, it comes it, on quick. It does. It comes on, it's so hard to bring it down, and it comes yes. right back on. Oh my god! I was like, I, I was laughing with my wife uh, last year because I had lost a bunch of weight, and I was about two o two. Nice. And, but I but I put on twenty pounds over the weekend. Wow. That's, That's just crazy. crazy. Yeah, just from eating like a slob. Straight yeah. up overeating. And uh, mm. it's a, it's an addiction too. It is Definitely. an addiction that I have to, that I'm, that's where I'm at right now. Trying to get to that, what you're talking about, where I'm being cognizant of what I'm doing when I eat. Because, you know, I was bad yesterday. I've had about, I had about four sodas. Oh. And soda's like my kryptonite. Dude, mine would be chips. <laughs> oh yeah, chips, man. I can't even so, keep them in the house, bro. No, I yeah, can't keep them in the house. They're so bad for you. They're so they're so delicious. I love them. So you, you said something earlier, right? Um, you were talking about how if you're having a, maybe you're having a bad day or something, then you'll go to that junk food, right? Yeah, that is like 
soothing yourself ex- with something external, right? That was literally, yeah, man, I did it with food. I didn't just do it with food, right? I did it with alcohol. I used to do it with pills, mm. you know. But it took me of like piece by piece, like like little um, incremental changes to transition my mentality from food is something that I just do because it's good and I want to satisfy my flesh to like, oh, I need good nutrition for because I'm an athlete, right? And I'm going to compete and I need my weight to stay in a certain range or I need good nutrition because my I don't want my joints to hurt or I want to get good rest. So it took a while, but now my brain literally just sees food as... I don't want to sound like that. Oh, I see food as fuel type of guy, but I literally see food like full food like um like a science, right? It's it's certainly something that should be respected for sure. Yeah, I try to make um I try to optimize my nutrition for my lifestyle. Yeah. So that's how I view it. Like calorie counting and I count I count calories, I count protein, I count carbs, I count fat. So all the macros, I try to make sure I prioritize protein. I try to make sure that um, I'm eating enough. I'm eating because sometimes I'll eat too much protein and I won't have enough carbs and I'll be like, I'll fill it in the gym. Like I usually I eat something bad on Sunday night and then I'm exhausted training Monday. Yeah. You know, because I'm like, oh, man, my nutrition was bad. They should teach this type of stuff in school, you know, because they should. it sounds like you're tuned in. Dial in. Right. You're, yeah. You really got to dial in because like uh, I don't pay any attention to that stuff. So I rarely notice like sometimes you just don't feel good, but you don't ever really think to yourself, oh, I don't feel good because I'm eating chips and soda yeah. and it just doesn't register unless you're really dialed in, as you say. And I, w- I would imagine as well that at first it was probably kind of hard to develop that type of discipline but I would imagine over time learning how to weigh and count calories and all that kind of stuff becomes familiar. I literally was like trial and error. Uh, so I would like, oh, let me eat this food. So for example, right, oh, what ha- what is the most like protein-dense food, right? Let me eat beef, right? I'll eat. And so I eat a steak. Like I eat a perfect example. I eat a big steak Sunday night, but because it was so fatty, I, I would be tired Monday, right? Uh, so I had to eat leaner meats because it, it I would be too tired. It would is, just make is that tired. where where they call food coma comes from? Like eating fatty meats? I think maybe because it's just harder for my body to my body's working harder to digest it. You know? Yeah. Oh, okay. But um, yeah. So I I try to eat lean lean proteins, um, high protein foods. If I'm going to eat carbs, it's usually like peas and carrots do you journal or like how do you keep track of all this so i used to have a dry erase board now i got it dialed in i don't need it right Mm -hmm. but i used to have a dry erase board that would say monday i eat this this is the calories this is the protein this is the fat this is the carbs tuesday and it was breakfast lunch and dinner snack breakfast and it was like that for every single day of the week Mm -hmm. so i don't have to guess and every so then they say hey we're going on men's retreat and i'm like terrified dude <laughs> no i gotta eat food that i don't have so i'd like sneak beef jerky in or something yeah, you know? right, right. it's just so hard and then i had to learn how to eat in a world where eating eating is like celebratory you know feel good right <laughs> Hey, we just had a great Sunday at church. Let's go eat. Let's go stuff our faces. Yeah, and yeah like, celebrate. Why don't yeah. we go exercise? No. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, why is it like yeah, that, right? It's just the, the yeah. culture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you had said that, uh, to switch gears a little bit, you had mentioned that you do marriage counseling. Uh, yeah. At your church and stuff like that. What kind of, I'm fascinated with marriage because I'm married and, you know, <laughs> you know sure. my wife and I, you know, we're, I, I figure we're like any couple. We have our, our issues. I mean, we're, we're, we're definitely madly in love, but we have our issues and things like that. What type of issues do, do, do you generally get from people that they're dealing with without being, you know, exposing anybody? But sure, sure. I'm sure there's things like fidelity, infidelity, but I mean, like, what kind of, like, normal things that people are dealing with? You would be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't, yeah. by how often I'm sitting across from a couple and I'm hearing the same, it's like a script. It's got to be, right? They're saying the same exact thing. Yeah. Oh, like, 
I would let, and it's usually this, right? To our, the whole point of our conversation about weak men, right? These, the, the husband isn't used to being a leader. He, now he's a Christian and he's been living his life as this passive type of guy, right? And this is what I always hear. I would let him lead, but I don't trust him to lead. But he doesn't do it right, right? Ah. <laughs> he, he wouldn't do it right. And so I'll always say, okay, you, you're, you've been leading and you're here. So you ain't been doing a great job. Ah, either. interesting. You know, okay. something has to change. And if things are going south, it, it, hey, husband, fix it. You're the leader. Take the worry off of your plate. You have enough to worry about as a wife, as a mother. Right, you have this calling in your life that doesn't include running the family or leading the family. So um, let your husband worry about that, right? And they'll, it's usually, that's like 90% of it is wife wants to be the head. Yes. And there's that, there's that friction there. Right. So I, I mean. But at the same time, they want to they, they wanna be in their femininity. And, yeah. But he's not getting me there. And it's like, well, you're leading and working either, you know, you're leading and working either. Yeah. And so I'll tell husbands like, hey, be a leader worth following in your family. Make it easy for her. Make it easy for her to follow you. Right. How would you suggest to a husband? So guys, all, those words, yeah. guys always say the same thing, right? Why do I always have to be the first to apologize? Why do I always have to fix the problems? Why do I always have to be the first to give in? And it's like, dude, that's literally your role. You're the one that sacrifices. You're the sacrificial person for your family. You're to love, you're to love your wife as God loved, Jesus loved the church. And he sacrificed and he himself. he died for the church. Literally, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amen. So I'll hear from Amen. one side, why do I always have to be the one to sacrifice? Why do I always have to be the one to give in first? And then from the other side, from the wife's side, I'll hear, why do I always have to submit to his leadership? Why can't I do, why can't we do the things the way I want to do them? And it's like, both of you guys are worried about your, the other person's role, right? So if instead of worrying about what my wife is doing or how she's doing her role, I'm worried about how I can do my role and vice versa, then you're really going to have a hard time out-pleasing each other, right? It just won't work. You're just going to yeah. both be out-pleasing each other and out-pleasing each other. So if, so if I'm worried about doing the best that I can as a husband and I'm not worried as much about making my wife do the best that she can as a wife. I see what you're saying. So in other words, uh, I'm going to do for my wife in this marriage without expecting something in return. I'm going to worry about my role. My role, okay. In the marriage. And so if she's worrying about her role, and how can I be, the, how can I be a submissive, a supportive wife? How can I be the helpmate to him? Yeah, be careful with that submissive. I know. Right? They don't like that. Submission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they do. You say it. I, so I've taught it the like in, in the front of the whole church, you know, and you, I'll cover it and right. I say submission and they just go, you know. <laughs> yeah, they definitely don't like that. But I mean, it's such a. But, but, but it, I think like also God made, made it in their nature to want a man that they can look up to that's going to take charge. What do they always say? I want a man that takes charge. Mm -hmm. Uh mm -hmm. It's just not in charge of me. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, lead me when I want to be led. Right, 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 right. So I think, yeah, there are things that, to your point, that God has, like, put into people. So um, men are problem solvers, right? Men are just problem solvers. Oh, honey, this bad thing happened at work. Okay, here's what you do. Right. This will fix it. No, just listen to me, you know, and you're like, no, no, no. I can fix your problem right now. So easy. Yeah, so easy. But uh, <laughs> but they don't want that. They don't want to hear it, right? Yeah. There's this whole, there's like side point, right? There's this funny video was going around, right? Where the lady has like a nail in her forehead, <laughs> like a nail in her forehead, right? Yeah, yeah. And she and she's going, I just have this pain. And, and he goes, the husband's like, because there's a nail in your forehead. She's like, don't tell me about the nail. I just want you to listen to me. And he's like, okay, honey. And she's but, like, my, yeah. my sweaters are getting snagged. And I just have this throbbing pain. And he's like, yes, honey, I'm sorry for you. Right? <laughs> and he like, literally, he's like, pull the nail out just of your pull head. pull the nail out of you. yeah. So men are problem solvers, right? Yeah. They're suited to lead. They're competitive. And women are not as suited for that, right? So to the original question, I think the roles get mixed up in the marriage and that's where a lot of the conflict. You no, know, it's very profound. You know, if you 
you answered it in a blanket kind of way. It's like, it doesn't really matter what the actual issue, it doesn't matter how you describe the issue, it all boils down, if it sounds like you're saying it boils down to one thing, we don't know how to be our role. Yeah. We don't know how to, a man doesn't know how to love his wife like Jesus loved the church, yeah. doesn't know how to die to himself, Yeah, get over that, she doesn't respect me the way I want to be respected, and she's not listening to me, but instead focus on being Christ-like, being holy, and the woman has a hard time letting go like uh letting letting the man fulfill his role without telling him how to do it or there's so much joy a woman a wife can have so much joy in supporting and fulfillment in supporting her husband so i'll use my, my own marriage as an example right my wife is really good at supporting me so sometimes people will say hey you know what She's a pastor's wife. She needs to be leading this thing at the church. She needs to be leading that thing at the church. I say, no, she doesn't. She does not. And I'm really defensive of her, right? Mm. She doesn't need to be doing that. Her, her ministry is supporting me. I literally cannot do my life without her. Yeah. She knows how to do the electronic stuff and she helps me with emails and appointment setting and she tracks everything for me and she supports me in that so that I'm able to do the things that I'm able to do. And she's fulfilled in that way. And it's not her program, right? She's not trying to to do her program. Well, you, you said something interesting that she's fulfilled in that way. Yeah. Is that because she's her role is in line with God's purposes for her? Or I believe so, yes. Okay. I believe so. There there are times when I think like obviously um, women can have callings like oh uh, to as musicians maybe in the church or to teach other women or serving in children ministry, teaching the children. Yeah, it's not like they have no roles of leadership. Right, right. Yeah. For sure. Um, but if you're if you're a wife, I think women can get so much fulfillment and true like, man, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm called because look how successful my husband is, right? He's successful because I'm supporting him. Look where we're at, right? And a lot of times it's like you're when they're opposed to each other, it's like you don't understand you're hurting yourself. You're fighting your husband or you're fighting your wife. You're literally fighting yourself. Absolutely. Yes. If she does good, you do good. You know, uh, not, my wife, for example, she's an amazing wife. And you've known her for a long time. So, you know, you know she's a, a really cool person. Yeah, for sure. She, she could take my anything that I have if she wanted to. It, the key word is if she wanted to. Okay. She could take my podcast to here. <laughs> she totally has it. Yeah. Like she's well liked in, in, in certain communities that we're a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, unfortunately, I, at the moment, I'm building this by myself because she's not on board with it yet. Right. Same thing with uh, Legal Doc Guy, which is a company that she helped me build. I, I had the idea to do it, but she started helping me do it and it was doing very well all my business comes from her that's amazing but it's if she wants to you know right. build it with me mm -hmm. i do the work i do the like the actual physical work. but she's like she's so amazing at doing the stuff at, in the supportive role mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but sometimes i would imagine not just my wife but many wives they also have their own ambitions sure that, that are not in line with what their husband's doing. It's, it's almost like we're competing against each other. Yeah. And I feel like that hurts us so bad because I know for, I know that there's nothing that I'm not capable of doing like this podcast, for example, I'm 100% sold and I'm in on it, mm. but I know that I'm at a disadvantage because my wife is not on board yet, mm. but I know as soon as she is, mm. as soon as she starts to see the light, whew, it's going to go from this yeah. And I think that that's like really key that a lot of times I think, and not to just to put it all on women and stuff, but I, I think there is value when a woman aligns herself with what the husband is doing, because at the end of the day, I want to be a good, whatever it is I'm doing. I want to be a good provider, mm -hmm. a good protector and a good preacher in the home. I want to do those things. Sure. You know? And I think that there's, I know that there's moments when my wife is on board with something and it just, it's like God just blesses it That's through crazy. her, yeah. you know? And so I know that 
there's obviously a lot of times as men we disappoint our wives sure where where we didn't we we fell short in some area and so it it's difficult for them to want to get back on board and with their husbands and and do what it is Mm -hmm. so for me personally i'm just like you know what i gotta i gotta like prove myself again i gotta make sure that day in and day out whatever it is you're doing as a man that you're 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 focused on it you're lasered in because I've been that kind of guy that, like, I'm lukewarm everywhere I am. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, 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 I'm half in as a dad. Mm-hmm. I'm half in with this, uh, you know, trying to be a lawyer thing. And mm-hmm. Now I'm talking t-shirt business. <laughs> and now I'm talking podcast. And mm-hmm. just talking jujitsu instructor. It's like, dude, where are you? You yeah, know? Yeah. And I think that also makes it, probably makes it difficult for women to really align, align because your husband, your me as a husband is is not even really sure where I'm headed, you know. No real, no real direction. Wow. And I was talking about this the other day on my podcast about focusing on that one thing. What's that one thing you're gonna do? Because I'm not the kind of guy, man. I've I've learned I'm just not that kind of guy that can work for someone else. Sure. I'm not that kind of guy that could be stuck in an office all day without making a difference in people's lives. I just want to be around. I didn't realize how much I liked people until I sobered up. Yeah. I thought I was an introvert. Turns out I'm not an introvert. That's at all. crazy. Yeah, right. That's crazy. I'm like everywhere I go, I'm chatting people up. Yeah, I just love, I just like talking to people. That's good. That's a calling. It, sure, I think so too, man. And like <laughs> two years ago, I never, you know, I bought this during the pandemic. Oh, really? But I just no, no, uh, just getting high too much and mm. drinking, and it never, never grew into anything. And it wasn't until I sobered up that I started having like i'm weird very strangely started feeling ambitious about stuff that's cool yeah very and uh that's guys that's how you should be right that's how men should be and i think that food craving or alcohol craving or whatever it is it kind of like dulls that manly part of you that ambitious part of you especially the food yeah i'm just like you know what i'm gonna just soothe my flesh and eat something Eat something junky. That's so, and you know, it, it's it's very strange how it'll it, it would keep me from prayer. Like mm-hmm. I noticed that when I was uh, eating less, you know, fasting basically, I just like felt like having these moments where like I would wake up at three in the morning and I would just go and sit in the living room by myself and get try to get into prayer, and I was like, well, it's not so hard, but on those nights where I was overeating. None of that. Just, no. I couldn't get myself. It keeps us. I, I felt like it was keeping me from from prayer, which I just feel is important. I'm, I'm learning about it still. I don't even really know if I know how to do it. But food, just smoke another pot, all that stuff. Just Feed the flesh. Feeding the flesh. Some For some reason, just keeps you distant. Well, so, like, sowing... The Bible talks about this concept of like sowing to the spirit or sowing to the flesh, right? And so take fasting, for example, right? If I'm, let's say I'm counseling with somebody and they're like, man, I'm struggling with this issue, right? I'm struggling with um, pornography, for example, right? I'm struggling with pornography. Um, Okay, so this is why I think you should fast. Because if you don't eat, you'll die. And so if you can abstain from eating that most basic fleshly desire, then something like pornography, it doesn't draw you as hard. Hmm. It doesn't draw you as hard because you've dulled your flesh. You've dulled the sensation of your flesh by denying yourself food. And in those times, instead of denying, and instead of going to the flesh, you start going toward, you naturally start gravitating towards things like prayer and um, Bible reading, fellowshipping with other believers. And so it's like the flesh kind of dulls down a little bit and the spirit sharpens up a little bit. It, it's such a weird concept. It's, it's just something you really got to dial into because there are things that will kind of like dull your, your the spirit. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. Like uh, maybe not looking at pornography, but maybe 
check looking a little too hard when you're at the gym and you, oh, you know, you know what sure I mean? sure and like it, you know or listening to music that you know you shouldn't be listening to it could be anything for yeah. any, it could be anything for anybody it could be r-rated movies it could be candy it could be looking at scrolling um just you've been on tiktok too much you know you've been looking at your phone too much or playing video games it literally could be anything food um and it's just one of those things it's like all of that is just like Oh, I'm feeding the flesh. I'm feeding my flesh. And so my flesh is really sharpened. Mm. And fasting is a great way to reset. And I use it as a tool myself to reset myself. For, oh, you know what? This thing is starting to become a real sin issue in my life. I need to fast and dull my flesh, sharpen my spirit mm. a little bit. Mm. So. Yeah, I'm hoping to. Uh, it's funny how just drinking a soda, yeah. it's like, man, I just. I messed up my whole day. Oh. Like, as far as dulling the, the flesh, you know, it's like, it's funny how, how it's like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Like, I hope that I can get you back on, you know, in a sure. few months, you know, and check up on you, see how you're doing, and talk more about these issues, you know. Sure. I, I believe very strongly that uh, one of the, one of the most, one, one very important thing especially as far as Christianity goes, is marriage. Yeah. It's right there in the beginning. You know, it, it, it's like, it's, the book is about Jesus, clearly. But there's this one thing that he puts in there, marriage. God made us in his, in his image, both male and female. And, you know, he, he talks about how once we get married, we leave our, our mother and father and become one with, and one flesh with our spouse. Yeah. And it's, it's by no mistake that the adam and eve story and the you know as i read the bible you start to see weird stuff sure it's especially comes stuff, alive it comes alive yeah. you know you start to see all the evil in the world mm -hmm. by reading that book mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. the devil literally is trying to convince the world of every, the opposite of everything that book says yeah everything in there like i can name things like uh Male and just even like male and female, something a, a mm -hmm. verse as simple as he made the he made man in his image, both male and female. He made them. It's a great example. Just changing it, yeah. or uh, or uh, you know, in, in the book of uh, I think it's uh, I forget which book, but but it talks about you know dressing modestly. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a culture where woman hear me roar. Remember, <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, yeah, yeah, there was woman. I'm a woman, hear me roar. Yeah. And I and I started thinking of that Bible verse. I was like. That reminds me of the, 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 he's like, wanders around like a, I'm paraphrasing here, but wanders around like a roaring lion to see who he may devour. Yeah. Like, what a choice of words yeah. to use to say, I'm a woman, hear me roar. And it's not to <laughs> knock on women, but yeah, it's yeah. like, it's telling you, be sexually promiscuous, be, don't be modest in your clothing or any of that stuff. It's just a lot of stuff that I'm fascinated with the book. Cause it's like, so, um, yeah, to your point about marriage, you know, I think um, one of the things that, so when, I, when I'm doing like a premarital counseling, right, those are like the, so often it, all the counselings are really hard and they're serious and it's like, yeah, my 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 kid's dead, my, my, my wife's dead, whatever, you know, and it's just yeah. really hard counseling. But premaritals are fun, right? It's fun, they're, they're getting ready to get married. And I'll ask him, so what do you guys think is the, like, it's, we go through a curriculum, right? And one of the questions in the curriculum is like, what is the purpose of marriage, right? And you'll hear a lot of typical answers like companionship or friendship or support, love, things like that. And one of the things that people don't realize is one of the purposes of marriage is it's a refinement tool, hmm. right? So... God is saying, like, I'm going to make you more into the image and like this. That is so, yeah, go on. And I'm going to use your wife to do that. Well, how does that happen, right? So picture yourself, I think, like, Chuck Smith uses this example, right? He's a Calvary guy. He says, imagine you're like a little, like a, a piece of marble, right? Just a, a piece of marble. And God is the sculptor. And he's going to chisel you into the image and likeness of him. Right. And so he starts to chisel away pieces and he's cutting a little off and he sand a little off here. Well, the problem is, is that all those pieces that are coming off, that's you. Mm. And so it hurts as it comes off. 
And so that's why that refinement process that's happening through marriage hurts. And marriage is hard because it's meant to be hard. It's meant to, to refine those pieces out of your character that God doesn't want there anymore and make you more into the image and likeness of Christ. Absolutely. I, I couldn't uh, agree more. You know, with, with my wife, I often tell myself, you know what, marriage ain't supposed to be easy. Yeah. He, he's, he wants you next time. She says something that triggers you. This is your opportunity to refine. I like that word, refine yourself and not respond this way. Yeah. You know, yeah. and like that. But, uh, man, thank you so much for coming on. For sure, and, man. And I can't it's wait fun. to have you on again. And um, Adam, yeah, pleasure, man. <laughs> yeah, man, so it's fun, much. fun. Awesome.